own Dr. Wolf's words, whom probably all of you know. I always found Wolf to be a very passionate and at the same time down-to-earth scientist. And his career path is very interesting and inspiring because of all the different background work he's done. He's worked in marine biology and in international relations in um, investment banking in London and then now in fisheries economics. Wilf has an outstanding curriculum as an early career scientist and his publications can be found uh, all, in all sorts of different journals. Uh, his work has been making waves in the national news and has uh, been cited uh, from around the globe. Uh, after Wolf completed his PhD in the Fisheries Center with Rashid Sumaida, he's now working in the Nereos project as a postdoc and research associate. And the Nereos program is a global research program focusing on predicting our future oceans. And Wolf's title today is Sell or Perish an Analysis of Japan's Fresh Fish Market as a News Vendor Problem. Please join me in welcoming. Thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, today's talk is on the, the idea of the uh, Japanese fresh fish market and how I came to see this as a, a part of a, a news vendor problem, which is one of the uh, type of problem that's dealt in the supply chain. Um, my interest has always been on the price of seafood. Why do you come to a certain price? What's, what's included in price? What's missing? Um, and last time I was here, well, well, last time I had a chance to talk to you guys, uh, I, thought, I mentioned this paper, the report that came out in 2013 that discussed that, that the assertive world's fish uh, food in general are being wasted. And at the time I argued that the main reason that this is done is not because people are being wasteful, but it's because in terms of uh, the way business is done, it makes sense to account for these waste. And I argued that, you know, it's made it's making sense because the price of fish or price of food in general are quite low, uh, it's cheap, and so therefore it's, instead of being efficient with your use, it's more uh, economical to just be wasteful. And, and in, in talking about the, the cheap price of fish, I was, I was start, um, getting into the idea of externalities, uh, the impact of production and consumption of food that are not captured in the price. Uh, and these include things like uh, environmental impact, social impact, things, the cost that, uh, that exists, the actual cost, are not being captured by the people involved in the transaction, but being passed on to others, uh, essentially being subsidized by people around you who's not involved in it, or the future generation. So, I, you know, uh, we're suffering from market failure, and the first cause of market failure is this idea of externalities. Um, and even going back even further, uh, when I was here fish, giving Fish 100 talk last time in 2013, uh, I mentioned about my experience going to Japan and uh, uh, working with Japanese small-scale fishermen. Um, at the time, the, these communities in the northern Japan had, had been, is in the process of recovering from, Japan, uh, or from the, the tsunami in 2011. And the idea was trying to come up with a new model, uh, some, some alternative model to make these fisheries viable. Um, these communities have been suffering from um, not necessarily economic collapse of their stock, but the uh, no, environmental collapse of the stocks, but the ec economically, they weren't being sustainable. And so, you know, I was talking to these fishermen, and they keep saying that they can't get the right price. The, the price just isn't high enough. And and you know, uh, there's nothing they can do about it. And so that was the ma main concern they had. And based on that, that, it comes to the idea of this second type of market failure. And that's based on the market power. Who has the control? Who sets the price? And, and that is driving another, uh, another cause in, in, in cheap food. So, so the, the, the question now is that if the market is not producing the, what I would consider true or a fair price of fish that includes that, that compensate the producers at, uh, for their, uh, at the fair, fair market value and at, at the same time including all the external costs, then 
what, what needs to be done? What can I do? And so my answer, or my, my approach was to then maybe actually just examine all the decisions influencing this uh, transaction, all the decisions in, involving transaction from the production all the way to that. And so in applying this approach and looking at each decision, I decided to get uh, to look into the idea of supply chain management and any research that are involved in supply chain management. And so uh, over the last six months, I've been working with uh, a colleague of mine at the Sada Business School who specializes in chain supply chain management and trying to incorporate some of the research that's been done in supply chain management into fishery research. Um, so briefly, what is supply chain management? Well, supply chain is activities and infrastructure that moves goods from one area to the other area of production, um, well, from the start to the end. And then supply chain management is uh, looking at all the de decisions required to ensure that more efficient, less costly, and profitable operation of supply chain. And so there's two approaches to this. One is to look at a specific problem on a way you localize and uh, uh, under specific constraint and see how the decisions are made, what is optimal. And the second approach is to, to look at more broad relationship between the linkage in the supply chain and how are the, how are the linkage is coordinated to ensure that uh, these decisions are uh, done properly. Um, in terms of fisheries, I found that there hasn't been much uh, this is being done on in terms of applying this idea of supply chain. Uh, historically, the fisheries economics or, or study in economics have been focused on the dynamics of fishing and and the analysis generally ended once the fish that was landed. Maybe talk about Gordon Schaefer model or any kind of economic model. We assume price to be fairly constant uh, and the price that the the fishermen can't, are the price takers, they can't influence the price. Um, and also, more recently, there has been some analysis on the, the other end of the supply chain, on the consumer end, looking at how the demand change, uh, specifically how does, the, how does the price of goods, uh, of, of demand and, and price change with uh, availability, uh, the income of the consumers, and so on. And also, uh, how does the uh, market integration that's brought about by globalization, how does it change the way uh, the demand and, and the structure are made? So uh, based on that, my idea was to look at the process between the two ends. And uh, you know, I started to do with some, to look at the fisheries that, that are most familiar with. So I started with the Japanese fresh fish supply chain. So, um, so on, just a quick introduction of the fisheries that I'm dealing with. Uh, I'm dealing with the coastal fisheries in Japan, which is this, this bit in the Japanese fisheries. Um, these are fisheries that stand very close to shore, uh, usually banned, uh, by vessels less than 10 tons in, uh, in the size. Um, and the catch has been fairly consistent uh, between 1.5, 1 million to 1.5 million, um, as indicated by Daniel's uh, figure of summaries of, of large scale and small scale fisheries. Oh, even though it is not the major part of Japanese fisheries, that's the industrial size, in terms of employment, it accounts for over 80% of the employment. Um, and most of these employment, uh, these employment, and these are those that are own operators. They are independent fishermen who are not part of co uh, corporation company. Uh, in terms of income, as I mentioned, they're not doing so well. Uh, that's the average household income over the last uh, 15 years. Um, it's in Japanese yen, but yen is. Million yen is usually about 10,000. So the average household income in fisheries are uh, between uh, somewhere around 20, 20, uh, 20 25,000 a year. 
Uh, another characteristic of Japanese coastal fisheries is that it has very diverse gear types, um, ranging from uh, large set nets to gill nets, um, some small scale trolls. The composition is, is uh, catch composition is highly variable, uh, both in, in terms of season, between seasons, and between region, uh, both in north, south, and about also between uh, Steel Japan and Pacific Coast. So this is what Japanese fisheries, fisheries market looks like. So we have a fisherman that goes out, catches the fish. They have no idea of the price. They have uh, no idea what the price will be. Uh, they have no, no idea how much they're going to catch. They just go out, fish, come back, deliver the fish to the this first wholesale. And this is in a local fishing market. Uh, the, the first wholesale basically act more like a broker. So they don't set the price. They don't, there's no negotiation of price between these in this link. The, this is mostly uh, just an agreed brokerage fee, usually about 5% of the, the price that fisherman gets will be received by this broker. And he will then go to the mar organized off, uh, market and, and either auction or uh, negotiate sales of the, of the product. Um, the buyer in the wholesale market are the wholesale second wholesaler. Or, and, and more recently, uh, authorized buyer who act as an agent for large buyer like supermarkets. And so, this has been the traditional route where the broker is organized auction, buyer based on the, what they see of the quality and his or her understanding of uh, the demand uh, bids, and, and either in open auction or in a closed sale of bids. To negotiate price, and so this is where the, the first set of prices formed. Um, this is then brought either to the central market, uh, basically the markets in a, in a major consumer market like Tokyo or Osaka, or and or some of them will be consumed locally to see the local market. Um, goes through the same process in here of going to the to broker and then another negotiation, another bidding. And then, the cons cons uh, and then from here, it goes to small-scale retailers, uh, which are basically uh, specialized fisheries merchants, so fishmongers, or um, goes to the supermarkets to authorize buyer, and then to a consumer. Uh, more recently, there's been an uh, approach to produce new type of supply chain. So this first one is to go to fisheries co and co-op will organize buying and selling uh, independent of going through the retailers and approach directly to the consumer. Or uh, more recently, Fisherman has opted out of, of going through the traditional uh, chain and approach direct sales to consumers through the internet holding. And so we're seeing that increasing diversification of this uh, supply chain. Um, and also, what we're seeing is, as I mentioned, uh, two different outlets for for uh, seafood uh, for the for the consumer. Um, over the last, well, the surveys no longer be done, but during the course of the last two decades, uh, we have seen an increasing market share of supermarkets, and uh, and and as a result, the fishmongers, the share of the specialized fish salesman, uh, salesperson, mongers are going down. And what's, what does it mean in terms of uh, supply chains? That they have two different types of uh, approach uh, uh, and also uh, incentives. Um, for supermarkets, their priority is to buy in huge quantity with small profit in each sales, but just uh, goes to the huge volume. And they're more concerned about the, the um, constant uh, 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 certainty in supply and, and um, in a price than a quality. Whereas these uh, fishmongers are more focused on different high value, high end and quality based sales. And also um, their approach to, to uh, perishability is also different. 
in the in the case of of uh, supermarkets, is to buy as many as much as possible and use the market power and use the the, the discount associated with buying a huge amount and let, you know include in that the model that part of that, that purchase will not be sold. But it's better to have uh, these products rather than uh, the amount of fish um, because the idea that uh, this yeah um, because because they use the reputation among the consumer is a key 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 driver, and therefore, um, so yeah, ninety dollar fish is is okay as long as they have fish at the market every day, uh, fish available at the at, at their store every day. Whereas uh, fish mongers approach take more of an approach of being able to negotiate price as the as the quality of the fish goes down. So they they have small small. They buy in a small batch, but they they can negotiate the price. They can uh, differentiate the price throughout the day to ensure that everything's sold at the end of the day. And so that's the two main approach, and that has impact on the way the uh, wholesale market operates. Um, so this is just a, a, to, some, to show how the the, the value of the, uh, what's being paid at the, at the retail end is distributed across the supply chain. Um, you can see that uh, I think when um, at the earlier this year, the community-based fisheries. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. she mentioned that the, the in Vancouver, she, uh, fisherman gets about 25 percent, and that's what we see in Japan as well. 20 percent plus a percent of the value is captured by the producer. And the large share is captured, 40% is captured by retailer, uh, which is different from the way the distribution of the value across uh, vegetable and fruits. And I argue that uh, the, this distribution is uh, closely related to the, to the risks that each each, uh, each each link in the chain, in the supply chain is taking. For example, basically the the, the second wholesaler in local markets that are responsible for delivering. The, what they purchase into the, the wholesale market and, and they went into a retailer, they take the huge part of the, the risk of fish spoiling. And so they take a huge chunk, and also the retailers who are the ultimate leader, or the buyer takes a huge chunk. Uh, so the, the, the main challenges in fish, uh, fresh fish supply chains is that there's huge uncertainty in production, um, there's huge diversity in product types. The dating is highly personal goods, so whatever that's been delivered that day, they have no choice to take it back, so have, everything has to be sold at the wholesale market. And there's lots of, a large number of independent producers that's delivering fish. Um, and that's causing a, a very strong competition on the, on the producer at the end, but uh, uh, not much of a comp uh, competition on the buyer end. And so, how can fishermen, in, within this context, how can fisheries? Fishermen uh, improve their bargaining power. So now that's I'm going to start looking at the supply chain series in how it price the fisheries. Um, in mainly there's two main areas of interest. First is the, the the system of auction, and second is the idea of uh, news news vendors problem. So I'll quickly go over some of the different strategies that's being applied in auction. Um, there's mainly three different modes of auction. First one is the English model. Which is the ascending price, uh, the bidders make, make, make public bids, and the last bidder remaining wins, wins, the, wins the lot. Um, the second type is the Dutch model, which is ascending price, and the first bid wins. So the, the, the auctioneer will mention the, the higher price, and given after a, <coughs> uh, a certain time limit, they move decreasing the Decrease the price until somebody makes a bid. And the main difference is the way information is shared uh, between bidders. So in the open bids, uh, you can you can the the, bid, uh, the bidders can see, uh, get information through adoption from other bidders and and accord, uh, uh, make this decision accordingly. Whereas this has one shot at it. And similarly, there's a Japanese model which is a closed seal bids, um, and this. Can depend either highest bid wins or 
like uh, in some other cases, they use the second highest bid of the, uh, uh, for the payment. Um, and there's been few, in recently, over the maybe last five, ten years, there's been an increasing number of uh, uh, research that's been done on the fisheries auction. Uh, and that's mostly because as, as these auction and, and records become digitized, the information are available to do a uh, high level assessment. And so some of the, um, the uh, so I'm going to provide some example of auctions in fisheries. Uh, first one is from Ancona in Italy. Uh, they look at this idea of declining price paradox, um, which is basically uh, saying that if we knew how much fish is available in the, in, in the uh, at the market that day, the price of, of the fish for the same quality and same quantity shouldn't change because that information is available at the start of the auction and, and same information is available at the end of the auction. However, we see that the, the price tends to decline throughout the day. And um, this research found that this declining in price, which given in, in the perfect information model, should, we shouldn't see, is being caused by people's valuation of their own time. And so as the uh, for some small-scale fishermen, the, the, the time they spend in the auction is quite valuable. So they are willing to spend more at the start of the auction in order to get out and go back to the shop. Um, and, so, and, and so this kind of uh, uh, same sequence can matters. And so the auctioneer can u utilize this kind of information to optimize the price. And also, uh, there's been some evidence of buyer loyalty to vessel. Um, and basic, what this means is that the buyers are using uh, vessel name as uh, some uh, assurance of quality. Um, in Paramos, there's been a study that shows that the differentiation of products tend to yield a uh, higher price, and that's causing, um, uh, that's allowing, uh, allowing by differentiating and uh, sitting on a small lot, so you're, you're increasing your buyer pool. Um, and instead, there was, uh, this study also found that the effort decision of fishermen uh, negatively linked with prevailing price. So if the price of the fish is down, they tend to go out and fish more, uh, which is counterintuitive to the idea that when the price goes down, you stop fishing. And that's because um, the the idea is not to maximize their daily profit, but to have a more steady income supply. So, so in, if the income from one day's sale is lower, they need to go out and ensure they bring it back the next day. And lastly, um, there's been an uh, increasing number of, of markets that are incorporating uh, electronic and remote bidding to increase the, the buyer pool. And this is not only increase the buyer pool, but it also increase the processing speed which then helps uh, to go through more auction quicker, which maintains the, the, the quality of fish as well. And by increasing the amount of bidders, it, it prevents uh, the sharing of information between the bidders in the auction. Um, one of the main problems with this, this electric remote bidding is that it shifts the responsibility of quality assur uh, assessment and assurance from buyer who, has, who examine the fish and buy to the sellers because these these, these auctions are not taking place without examination of the, of the goods. And so that, even though this type of um, system is increasing, having increasing, uh, having the effect of increasing the, the price of individual lots, it's actually causing more cost in terms of setting up for this type of auction. Um, so now I want to move on to my main thing, which is uh, the new news vendors problem. And this is a problem in the uh, supply chain management research that specifically looks at the inventory uh, model for, for perishable goods uh, and stochastic demand. And so what it means is, what is the uh, best uh, strategies for purchasing? How much you should purchase to stock your stores given that uh, you're dealing with perishable products, so the product cannot be carried on to the, to the next time sequence, and also that the, the demand from one day cannot be carried over to the next day. So if you, if you can't meet the demand that day, that demand is lost. Uh, and demand is stochastic and it's, uh, it's unpredictable. So you, you have to use expectation. So the model is based on 
this idea that you have a demand that's random, uh, you have the, the uh, cost associated with all the stopping, so this is usually the cost associated with unsold goods, and the cost associated with understocking uh, low sale you were able to deliver. And so given these uh, information variables, what is the uh, purchasing, uh, optimal purchasing quantity? So uh, the function is that you want to minimize your cost, which is the expected overstocking cost and and or understocking cost. So so you 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 put the the, the what is the amount you want to buy, and this is the cost associated if the stock is when you, uh, when the demand is less than what you what you and, uh, expected, and this is the cost associated when the realized demand turns out to be greater than what you, uh, what you, what you stopped. And so you can drive the optimal, uh, optimal purchasing quantity by taking this variable and solving it. And you get the, the solution that it's the cost of, unit cost of understocking uh, divided by the, the the sum of unit cost of overstocking and unit understocking, and that's the inverse demand. So basically, the quantity you want to you want to uh, stop your optimal quantity is function of CU, CO, and then the shape of the demand. Uh, if you increase the cost of overstocking, your your quantity decreases. If you uh, if you increase the cost of understocking, you are uh, your optimal. Uh, quantity increases, and so, so in this way, you can decompose the quantity that you that other wholesalers to buy into two components: the the uh, cycle stock, which is the amount that you want to deliver uh, to meet the demand. So, in, if the if you assume the demand is normally distributed, this will be the mean, uh, and then the safety stock is to hedge against the demand being. Uh, too, more, too, too much. And so, um, what other, other uh, uh, fisheries can do is to, to reduce the waste, waste the fish by, uh, by manipulating the overstocking and understocking cost. Uh, and what's included in the overstocking cost is this whole idea of what well, your purchase price, uh, the processing cost from delivering from what you purchase to where you want to take it. And then the, uh, minus the salvage value. And this salvage value means if you don't feel money to sell your fish or the fresh fish, you can sell it out of something else the next day, uh, either fish cake or fish fries in, in your lunch special. Uh, the cost of understocking includes loss sale. But in addition, there's this thing called goodwill lost, uh, which is uh, the impact on your, to your reputation. So, uh, and we see this in, in, in many shops, uh, even in uh, grocery stores. You know, we see mountains of uh, food, and, and that's mainly because they, it's not because they expect to sell all that food and, and uh, produce in one go, but because they want to maintain, maintain that, that reputation that, you know, even at, uh, whenever I go, the food, the, whatever I'm looking for will be there. So, uh, what I'm playing with uh, is, is to create a model that produces some kind of manipulate this cost of understocking and, and prevent, penalize. Um, Wholesalers for overstocking, and one of the approach I'm, I'm uh, incorporating is this: uh, is to use uh, waste tax or waste penalty, and how does that change the way uh, the wholesaler behave? And so uh, I'm I'm working on this model, and I, I I have to apologize. The model I was hoping that I can get it done by now and present some of the results, um, but. It's still under construction. So I'm, I'm creating a, a two two part model. So the decision will be made on both ends, at the fishery end and also the buyer's end. Uh, the fishery end is you have multiple uh, fishermen delivering fish to the wholesale market, and so they are in this Connaught competition, uh, quantity competition, uh, to to in a game to see what you should deliver given information you have about uh, what other I might do. Um, so they have the catch. As a given, um, but they have options of, of delivering to the fresh fish market or using one of the alternative 
supply chain to deliver somewhere else, at possibly at a discount price, uh, and hold, uh, hold a discount price. And as a buyer, you, you have this uh, uh, multiple competitor news vendor. Uh, so they have two, uh, two or three news uh, uh, buyers with different set of um, uh, CU, the over overage and average cost, uh, and, and and with different levels of taxation on it. And see, and, and this news vendor uh, problem gives solution to the uh, uh, aggregated wholesale demand curve. And so, so instead, I, I'm not, I won't be able to model the, the the auction and competition. But what I can do is model the demand curve given different types of uh, uh, average and average cost, and and that would determine how much the fisherman gets for the, uh, and that in combination with what's been delivered as aggregate by the fisherman gives the the, um, <coughs> the value for the fish. And and I want to. With this model, I'm hoping to include some of the different strategies that, that fishermen can use in addition to the wastage tax to improve their uh, negotiation power. And one of the things that involve uh, risk sharing kind of contract. So um, it, it's almost like a refund. Uh, you, you deliver something, and if you don't sell, you buy it back, or you get the credit back. But in, in exchange for that credit, the price you receive is higher. There's a premium for that. Uh, other one includes revenue sharing, which is similar to the risk sharing, but is, is more co coordinated between uh, it by taking the contract. And finally, the information sharing. So the fisherman has better information of what the what the fine, uh, uh, detail demand is and um, the, the the cost structure of the wholesaler. And to measure the outcome based on the share of the profit how much fish is wasted, and, and consumer satisfaction, as in other demand being met. And, 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 and so what it's saying is that by, by increasing the cost of wages, you can change the decision making of the retailers, and perhaps possibly reducing demand. Uh, what I haven't been able to model, or I won't be able to model in the, the, the previous model, is if this short, short point demand can be uh, filled by small scale buyers, uh, and what is the implication on the resource? Right now, I'm assuming that the, the demand, the supply and demand could be in, in equilibrium. Uh, yet, that the value, uh, variation in viability in both supply and demand is causing these waste. And, and so there's no uh, monitoring of the, the resource space here. Um, Another component of the of the supply chain uh, uh, supply chain management analysis I want to talk about is this more on, a, on as I mentioned on a broader scale. Uh, so the one the modeling work I was focusing on is on a smaller scale, and I want to talk about more on, on a broader scale. And that is this whole idea of a, a corporate uh, social responsibility, um, and it's it's it's. It's the idea that the corporations and bigger uh, com companies take more uh, proactive role in addressing some of the social goods uh, beyond what is being required by the law. And, and there's uh, arguments on why corporations and companies should be taking on these, these challenges. And the first one is the ethical argument uh, that it is in uh, is responsible responsibility of the Operation to do no harm if the cost is uh, is not prohibited, and if the cost is then it's prohibited, then it should be enforced by uh, public policy. But also, there's strong economic argument on why corporations should be taking on this additional responsibility. Uh, one is that is to increase the profit by making uh, by appealing, improving the corporate culture and brand. Uh, also, it's, it's the idea that you, you, if you, when you're operating in some kind of a, a business in, a, in certain communities, you need to get a social license from that community support uh, insurance that, that you know, the um, And also, uh, it has impact on consumer behavior. And some of the, some of the work that's been done with the uh, 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 certification program 
up, uh, uh, focus on this last uh, this argument that it changes the consumer behavior. Um, and so, uh, since last summer, I've been looking at this corporate social responsibility of companies. Uh, I've tried to get the the uh, looked at unnecessarily publicly traded fisheries companies in, in the world and uh, create a database, break it down by, by characteristics of firms, uh, characteristics of type of corporate social responsibility activities they're doing, uh, what are the, what are the uh, reporting requirements, and so on. Um, and then some of the primary finding is that uh, most of the focus has been on the external standards, uh, use of uh, things like MSC, OSC, uh, any in, uh, inter, uh, internal labor organization standards. And the, the social component of the pro, uh, uh, CSR policies tend to be focused more on the aquaculture firms uh, that are response, that has very big region specific operations. And fisheries have very, fishes, fishing company has been lacking, uh, uh, lagging behind the aquaculture company when dealing with the social, social component of their responsibility. And finally, that um, because the focus is on the environmental standards, um, there has been no consideration on impact of their, their uh, behavior on small scale and local fisheries. And finally, uh, some of the other uh, application of the supply chain management model that I want to I want to pursue is this idea of how does the implication of uh, emergence of aquaculture as a competing source of of seafood and more uh, a source with more certainty, how do they change the, the wholesaler uh, uh, and retailers in inventory decision? And also, uh, in Japan, there's been this discussion of, of deregulating the fisheries to allow corporations to start operating fisheries in small scale fisheries. Uh, traditionally, the fisheries has been exclusively. Uh, independent and, and has to, the fishermen have to get their license from fisheries co uh, cooperators. But by deregulating and allowing corporations to own fleets that supplies exclusive to them, how is that going to change the, the interaction in the wholesale market? So those are two questions I, I, I'm hoping um, I can up, up, apply and and start looking at. So uh, so that's. That's uh, what I want to talk with today, so if you have any questions. Smaller, but it still exists. So and that's, they're, they're keeping those prices 
they're they, even though they have a lot less risk, they're keeping the differential, the the markup is large because they can get away with it. Uh, I think that's one of the things. And it, but what I showed was uh, the proportional uh, distribution of the of the value across the trade. So that, and the actual price might is is coming down because these risk is being mitigated and in, and uh, some of the, the uh, fresh fish is being seeing increasing competition from frozen fish, in, imported frozen fish. So the the, all, the, the average actual fish and the, the real price of fish is coming down. And so the price is coming down and the share of the, the price is more, the fisherman's share is even smaller. Um, are there any examples of fish that are that you're looking at that already exist, or is this just a new? Uh, no, this uh, it's it's a new, new approach. Uh, I don't, don't think it's, it's, it exists. No. Is there a question that was exactly the exact same. Oh, okay. So I was a by the value distribution yeah. that you showed, and so you showed the fishermen getting about twenty-five percent, mm -hmm. agriculture getting about fifty percent. Yeah. Um, which seems like a big difference if you realize that well, the fishermen don't have to raise the fish um, mm -hmm. and put in that extra just harvesting. I was wondering, where does aquaculture fit in here? Because it looked as though, also in your earlier figures, that people about aquaculture make twice as much money. Mm -hmm. and do they get a bigger proportion of the final value? And I think, I, I think they have, because they can control the production, yeah. and I think that's where, that's where the, the the, di the difference in market power, ma ma market share comes from, is that in fisheries, you, you have no, no control of how much you're producing. Uh, you can change, you, you know, uh, we can argue that you can decide not to fish if the price is too low, but given that most of these small fish scale fishermen are already on, uh, not making that much money, and, and the fishing activity is already being restricted by conditions like weather, uh, whenever they have a chance to go out fishing, they will go out fishing. And so they have no, they can't reduce the production when, or they can't uh, defer the, delay the production when, or, uh, when, when the price is not good. Uh, whereas in agriculture, I think that is possible. And, and, and um, the, the perishability, perishability in agricultural product is much, uh, much less than in fisheries. So if you show the value distribution for aquaculture, yeah. is it closer to agriculture? Yeah. Uh, I would think it would be closer to agriculture. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah. yeah well, uh, thanks to the presentation, I'm not, not really doing any financial stuff in the economic stuff, so I'm really like caring a little bit more about this stuff and what's going on. Um, I had a question regarding the uh, the way fish tax, like, yeah. I mean, I can imagine that because of how the industry is set up and stuff, you know, politics and all that, mm -hmm. is, like, it, they, like they, there could be a number of barriers yeah, uh, in front of... Uh, I think implementation might be more difficult, and I think a uh, more realistic option is to do, uh, not not necessarily penalized waste, but reward uh, uh, reduced waste, and that would be uh, something like um, yeah, so, but I'm, I'm, I'm still not sure how, how it's going to be done, but yeah. 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 Uh, one last question. Sorry, um, just back on that. Um, it's not really obvious. Like, there's already a tax on waste, right? They paid for this product. Yeah. Not getting there is already a tax there. Mm -hmm. Adding something more on top of that, it's not really obvious, is it? Like I'm trying to think it through. It's not really obvious who's going to bear the cost of that. There are always going to be inefficiencies in that supply chain, right? Things are not going to find a no. buyer. And if you make people be extra conservative about how they do things, and ultimately they might just buy less fish, right? Especially yeah. if you make the price of the fish going to a consumer half what it is going into bed, whatever it is. So my point is that that you know it might ultimately that tax might. It, it might be much better to go with the recycling or reusing or remarketing of the waste than it is to tax it. Because the tax might actually just shut down fisheries. They no, might... but I think the tax is, the, the purpose of the tax is to to let the, the wholesaler be more conservative in their estimates mm -hmm. of overage or yeah underage. And so they can accept that, you know, sometimes they're gonna they're not gonna be able to meet the demand. But that's better than going over 
uh, and and I mean these waste, uh, wasted fish. Do you think it will benefit the consumer? I guess that's what your model's about. Like, who does that tax benefit and cost? But uh, I think it, it won't benefit. Con uh, yeah, because you would if what is what's going to happen is that you uh, encourage. Um, by pro providing this space, the, the more supply will be available for consumption. Uh, no, wait, that's not true. It's not obvious, no. is it? I can't yeah. think it through. I think it's, you really, did. this is why the model is so cool, because I think you're going to reveal some really kind of you know, counterintuitive things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's neat. Right, uh, some comment about aquaculture. I think the figure uh, you showed yeah. actually shows that the, the development and, and sort of like the, the, the uh, going down. Yeah, the last year was, was in, 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 in the early figure, which um, the aquaculture um, um, twice as much as uh, world catch was when um, every fisherman started doing aquaculture everywhere. Everybody mm -hmm. in Japanese coast, everybody would start doing the whole stuff on. And, and all uh, uh, salmon aquaculture, which um, a lot of money came from either government or, or, or uh, commercial companies and such times. But some of the fishermen actually failed to do it because they used the environment just far too much and ended up not making as much as money possible. All the oyster just went down, really, the price itself. So that actually shows it was it was double and it uh, went a lot less. And the, so the side of that, um, I talked to Wilf about this, but the last time I went back to Japan, there was just a huge push on um, in Japanese supermarket selling Alaskan crab or you know the the, the uh, American lobster um, to eat either Christmas or the New Year. It was just a huge push. I've never seen it anything like that whatsoever. It was very interesting, and and in terms of supply chain <coughs> management, it's a lot easier for the Japanese supermarket to buy a fish from the states. Especially if it has uh, um, uh, um, MSC label on it, then, then it will be easier for them to say they really manage their supply chain because they don't really have to think about it. And it's all also it's all frozen; they don't have to think about the way it's the eye. Um, the, but my you know uh, a concern if that itself will kill the Japanese coastal fisheries, and if that's a good thing for the environment or not. I mean, that's another thing which you're trying to answer, right? The, 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 my question is, by setting up sort of like a savvy supply chain management system by using your model, you think we can kind of like mitigate the, the, the pressure coming from outside um, or important um, fish which got uh, MSC certificate and EU got a supply chain management? Um, the thing is, I, I think the, the consumer part of the thing is not modeling here. The yeah. consumer demand is, I, I mean, I take it as given. So the the change in consumer demand based on competition from somewhere else is not captured in there. Um, so I think that would be another set of questions that needs to be addressed. Uh, yeah.